This week's episode is dedicated to our Explorer of the Week, and it is once again Jonathan Perner. Jonathan, thank you so much for supporting Aliens Explored, our our little podcast where we like to discuss the strange and mysterious. We're so happy that you enjoyed it, and to all our patrons out there we really appreciate all the support you give us it helps us to keep going and to make more and more of the episodes that we know you enjoy listening to now if you want to be an explorer of the week like jonathan all you have to do is go to patreon.com forward slash aliens explored and pick one of the tiers that include the explorer of the week uh, reward there are all sorts of various tiers and rewards on there so do have a good look uh, at what there is i'm sure there'll be something for you but anyway on with the episode thanks again to our explorer of the week jonathan perner Aliens Explored is a podcast exploring famous and obscure cases of UFO sightings, alien abductions and other strange events from both a believing and a sceptical perspective whilst keeping an open mind. I'm Stu Jackson, a professional actor and amateur ufologist with a particular interest in the crop circle phenomenon. I'll be debating that otherworldly visitations are real. The truth is out there. And I'm Neil Kelly. I'm a professional actor as well and used to work for the military as an intelligence analyst. I'll be arguing from a more doubtful point of view. I mean, it's all a bit far-fetched, isn't it? Richard M. Dolan is one of the world's leading researchers and writers on the subject of UFOs. And he believes they constitute the greatest mystery of our time. He co-authored a speculative book about the future, AD After Disclosure, the first ever analysis not only of how UFO secrecy might end, but the all-important question, what happens next? Join myself and Neil here on Aliens Explored as we discuss the life and work of Richard Dolan. Hello listeners and welcome back to Aliens Explored, your weekly look at the mysterious skies, UFOs, IFOs, UAPs, IAPs, USOs and uh, and all the government conspiracies that uh, that pertain to those. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Neil Kelly. And I'm your other host, Stu Jackson. Jackson. Uh, it's not. It's not conspiracies. It's real. I'm convinced. Of course, of course, it is. <laughs> but but even you know, even conspiracies actually happen, don't they? Oh yeah, absolutely. Just because just because you're a conspiracy theorist doesn't mean there isn't actually a conspiracy going on. I mean, <sighs> and they're, they're playing conspiracy years, but in your... just a th- another word for theory. No, I mean, if you and I, you and I, um, meet up to plan to do something nefarious. We're involved in a conspiracy if we if we conspire to undermine, of course, yeah, um, the the result of a horse race or something because we got bets. So that's a conspiracy. Uh yeah. So I so, take it all back. I'm I'm saying like it isn't a conspiracy. It is a conspiracy. It is a conspiracy. Conspiracy. Yes. <laughs> but I, but the conspiracy theorists. Well, they're, they're people who see conspiracies. Conspiracies are real, but conspiracy theorists see them. Everywhere. Well, it's a it's a term that's come into usage, and it's kind of been bastardized a bit. It's mm. like when when you know going on social media and people started referring to me as a social justice warrior. Mm. I I actually took it as a compliment. Oh yeah, I would. Yeah, anyone um, who uses that know. as a pejorative term is a, is going to be a dick, aren't they? Well, yeah. Uh, there's that, <laughs> but no, I wasn't aware of the <laughs> the connotation to it when it first happened. Um, well, the, I mean, the only time I'd heard the term "do gooder" used in a pejorative and negative sense was when I used to watch '60s Batman, and the <laughs> villain you know, when when caught out say, "Why are those meddling do gooders?" And uh, yeah, suddenly do gooders has been a, a bad thing. You know, we yeah. don't want do gooders. We want we want total arseholes in our lives, <laughs> on the people who have who have turned up with the intent of doing some good. 
considering the type of people who get uh, elected into office both sides of the pond, well, not more mm. recently in America, I think, you know, definitely taking a step in the right direction more recently in America. But, um, mm. yeah, prior to that, uh, with he who shall not be named, um, yeah, I think people I'm do sure, want I'm sure, I'm sure many, many, of our, some, <laughs> many of our listeners are, um, are supporters of the um, of president number 45, and uh, they do believe the election was stolen from him. Um, it it's it certainly wasn't it certainly wasn't won by Biden. It was you know when when I saw that the Democratic Party had had announced that um, that Joe Biden was going to be their 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 candidate for president, you know, Mister Mister Brand X, someone who no one's going to get excited about, who no one's going to campaign for enthusiastically, who would never fill a stadium with supporters all all cheering him on. I thought, yeah, they're making exactly the same mistake in, as they did in twenty sixteen, and it wasn't he didn't win it, but I believe that Donald Trump lost it. Well, bear in mind, Biden was the um, VP for Obama. He was, yeah, and uh, there's some. There's some negative history to dig up there. There's all sorts of no. Yeah. Oh. oh yeah. Well, let's let's okay. Yeah. Let's, let's not go yeah. down that rabbit hole. Let, let's not pretend <laughs> Obama was some kind of left wing well, liberal. Uh, you know, no, he was a conservative. But, yeah, but conservative small C. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's like is that comparing yeah. Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer? You know that. that... Yes. Which one do you hate the least? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, we're not getting into all that here. Uh, we're no, here. that's not what we're here for. This is not a political show. No, um, please. although we do get political on But Those of you who are reaching for the off button, <laughs> uh, please stay with us. We, we've stopped now. Uh, yeah, we are here to talk about uh, someone whose political alliances I am completely unable to discover. Um hmm. He is a ufologist, an author, writer, uh, sorry, author and writer, author and editor and researcher uh, in the field of ufology, Richard Dolan. Richard you, Dolan, yes. You see him quite often on these shows like Ancient Aliens and, um, you know, all the various documentaries uh, giving um, his opinions. Yeah, known for Hangar One, the, the UFO Files, um, yeah. Sci-Fi Investigates, and most recently in 2021, The Underground. Yeah, he's well, he's done quite a lot of things. Um, mm. He's a regular face, and I mean, I'm sure if, if our listeners aren't sure who we're talking about, if you Google his image, although when you Google Richard Dolan, there are a lot of them out there on Google. Yes, it won't necessarily be the first one in the list, but it's... No, but uh, yeah, American chap uh, from New York. Mm. Uh, he was uh, yeah, he he was an academic, studied history. Mm. Um, now here's an interesting thing. Like I say, he, he crops up all the time on these various programs, and uh, and presumably as as an author who writes prolifically on the subject of ufology, uh, mm. I'm guessing that's why. But I can't. I'm struggling to find information about him. Well, me too. I mean, I, I saw that uh, that he has a book. Should we plug his book on this show? It's got a number of different books. Um, but are you referring to his most notable one, which is After Disclosure? No, I was looking at um, The Alien Agendas, a speculative analysis of those visiting Earth. Oh, is that his most recent one? Um, it's... Uh, it's it's the one that that came up. It's the one that was being pushed most by by uh, Amazon. It doesn't doesn't have a, a date on it. Um, available on Kindle for six pounds and eleven. Uh, he has done uh, quite a number of books: um, Abduction in My Family, Recovery, a novella. Dark Side hmm. of Cupid, Alien Viruses, Admissible, UFO Area 51, FBI hmm. CIA UFO Connection, Three Minutes in June, The Legacy of 1952, 
AD After Disclosure, which is probably his most notable one. We'll mention mm-hmm. that again in a moment. Chronology of a Cover-Up, 1941 to 1973. The Cover-Up Exposed, 1973 to 1991. 21st <laughs> Century Mind, Secret Space Program, and UFOs and Disclosure in the Trump Era. Mm. He's done quite a lot of writing. But yeah, After Disclosure is probably his, his most widely known work, I would say. Um, hmm. He in it he speculates kind of what would happen. I mean, let's say you know UFO landed on the White House lawn tomorrow. Um, you know that would instantly, if publicised, you know it, it, the 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 gig would be up. The secret would be out. And uh, in this book, after disclosure, he speculates about what would happen to humanity hmm. um, on various different levels. Uh, after that happens, so you know what happens politically, what happens religiously, spiritually, what happens, you know, in terms of governments and keeping secrets and things like that. Uh, spoiler alert for anyone. I've, I've not read it myself, but I've read uh, a lot of writings on it, <laughs> as mm. it were. Um, it, is, it is on my to-read list. Um but yeah, spoiler alert for anyone who's not read it. Um, mm. It's a shit show, apparently, according to to Richard. It won't be very good at all. We won't. We won't us. take it very well. Oh, it's going to cause a lot of upheaval, apparently. Mm. Would it really? I, I just don't. I don't know why. When people say, oh, well, you know, I always thought there was something out there, and now here they are. Yeah, but it's one thing to speculate. It's one thing to believe that happened. But if you had incontrovertible proof tomorrow, Hmm. I mean, it it would throw your entire world view into disarray. Well, you know, many of our listeners have had experiences which have convinced them that uh, you know, they, they have seen beings from other worlds. Yes. Well, certainly the certainly the, the craft they arrive in. So, you know, they, they, they're, they're interested in the idea. They want to talk about it, but they're not, they're not running in the streets screaming. Well, no, but you're talking about individuals, not a society. Um, mm. there, there's a, uh, oh, do you know, I, I, I always end up misquoting it, but there is a beautiful quote from Men in Black, the, the mm. comedy movie um, with Will Smith. Uh, and it's Tommy Lee Jones who says the light. He says, Individuals are smart, but groups of people are dumb, panicky, and they're, they're just stupid. And I think there's a lot in that. That, well, there's another quote that um, the the IQ of a crowd is the number of people is the square root of the number of people in the crowd. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the average IQ divided by the number of people in it. Yeah, but um, but Richard Dolan argues that the alien presence. I mean, he he's listed as one of the world's leading historians of the UFO subject. Is he is he a historian of anything else? Uh, yeah, so he studied, um, originally he studied US Cold War strategy, right. European history, and international diplomacy. Right. and That's his credential. I get the impression, just looking at the blurb, that he's he's looking at the, the impact of our meeting people from another world through that lens, through the lens of how the the national security state would um, would 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 view it, and and the fact that he uses a term like national security state is an indicator of his um, political leanings, I think. Uh, but he does argue that um, you know, the alien presence is especially important now because we the rapid transformation of human civilization into something we've never before experienced. I mean. Society is always changing. Into something that say, never yeah. before. It's just <laughs> happening of it. particularly fast at the moment. We don't have a proper name for what we're going through, which they probably didn't at the time. They probably the idea, you know, the Industrial Revolution came up a long time after it had actually happened. Um, 
but a, a combination of radical new technologies um, with a social order that ultimately might make human civilization more like the societies that these other beings already have, which is very speculative, I would say. A tightly centralised and controlled social order with sophisticated science and technology. Yes, I I would say, even I would say, yes, that's that's very speculative and that's a very specific view Mm. of, of how these extraterrestrial interdimensional i mean that's the thing we don't even know what they are so how can we speculate how they think um, hmm. find that yeah that that i would say is a bit of a jump um but that whole thing about the speed at which society is changing um is something i've i've raised a few times now uh, in fact there was there was quite a an interesting discourse about it in our um, Patreon-only Discord server quite recently hmm. uh, at time of recording, um, where yeah, yeah. some of our some of our patrons were uh, uh, expressing views. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I I don't think we're going through technological change that that rapidly, not as rapidly as my grandparents or great grandparents would have experienced. Back at the end of the nineteenth century, beginning of the twenty first twentieth century, I think they they would experience far more radical change. You think? Yeah, I mean, for instance, um, we can get on a plane and fly somewhere, and it's it's a, probably a better experience than it was, you know, when when I was a kid. But when my grandparents, great grandparents, were were born, flight wasn't a thing, unless you got up in a balloon. That was, that was the only way you could fly. The, actually, heavier-than-air flight, aircraft, weren't a thing. Recorded music wasn't a thing. If you if you wanted to hear music, your, your only option was live performance. If you wanted music in your home, you had to learn to play an instrument and get the sheet music and and perform it yourself. Um, same with you – know, there were no such things as movies. They, they would have to go to the um, – they would have to go to the, the theatre to watch a show and so on. And when I think of – all the technology we've got now, for instance, all the technology in my iPhone, there's nothing much there that I didn't have back in the 1970s. It's just much improved. But it's not I, radical. I, I can I, make a phone call. I can send a message. I can listen to music. I can take a photo. I could do all those things 50 years ago. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... So you're saying in the 70s, but you're comparing that to, like, the 1900s. Yeah, so the, the 1900s okay. or the, the 1890s. There was a massive difference between those two decades. Yeah, there was, yeah. But what I'm saying is the difference between between the, the 1890s or 1900s and the 1970s was a much bigger difference than between the 1970s and now. Yeah, my grandparents were born into a world where there was no such thing as an aeroplane and they saw a man walk on the moon. Yes. If, if, uh, for those listeners of ours who believe that a man walked on the moon, <laughs> not all of them necessarily do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think they, they saw massive, massive radical technological change that they wouldn't have imagined. Whereas, we've, how, how, what technology have we seen that we couldn't imagine? I mean, this, uh, we're talking to each other over Zencast and so we can see each other while we're talking. Well, they used to do that in Thunderbirds back in the 1960s. So, you know, we, we knew it was coming. Did we, though? Yeah, we did. I mean, John Stonehouse, the, the notorious Labour MP who faked his own death when he got in a bit over his head in his own personal life, personal professional life, um, he made a speech in the House of Commons talking about how this massive investment in post office telephones and in the future when we have, I think he called them, um, he didn't call them video phones. He, he, it was some archaic name that you'd expect in the 1960s. A picture, maybe picture phones or something like that, where you can actually see the person you're talking to. That's over fifty years ago. So that was speculated about, you know. Yeah, but when you're talking, so when you're talking in the seventies, I agree with you about, you know, yeah, your grandparents would have seen a huge change, and a massive part of that was obviously the development of the microchip. Um, not. Well, yeah, from from the nineteen seventies onwards, um, but, it's made it's it's improved all the things that we have. But to um, 
to, to address some of the ones that you mentioned, like you mentioned about movies, well, that was just a development from photographs. Yeah. Which, yeah, it was, you but... know, had been around for a long time. Well, the, yes, the... Air, aircraft were new, but, but travel wasn't new. It um, was slower. Tra- travel was much, well, so slow to the extent that you wouldn't go a long distance unless you intended to stay there for a long time. Oh, you, wouldn't nip a, you wouldn't nip across the Atlantic for a weekend. But you, you look know, at you, the... You'd go to start a new life. The lives that we lead with, with social media and... I mean, like you say, you know, we're we're we're, we're doing this over the computer, through hmm. cameras. Um, I mean, you know, this is this is like having a TV studio in in your in your spare room. <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, well, as, as recently I, I graduated from drama school in in two thousand and eight. Well, in in those days, for instance, self tape auditions weren't a thing because. Pretty much nobody had the wherewithal to record Absolutely. and certainly not edit um, a piece of video. Didn't yeah. you know, back in two thousand and eight. Yeah, and now it's it's becoming the standard thing for for our listeners who hmm. are not aware. A self tape audition uh, is basically as actors we are given the lines, the the audition piece to do, and we do it to camera, which we then send off. Um, yeah, I mean, in in the old days, casting director, you would have turned up to an audition. Up. Yeah, and I'm sure Americans are probably more used to this. What they call the cattle call audition, where you'll turn up and there'll be a line of two hundred odd actors all rehearsing the audition piece, and they all get their couple of minutes in the room, and you know, it's it's a real lottery. Oh, I hate and, those. Yeah, I mean, cattle I only calls. ever went to a couple, and um, the the self tape audition where where you just recorded at home is is had pretty much already replaced that before even the pandemic. Obviously now a lot more auditions are are done remotely just to Yeah. A lot of a lot of actors don't like them, but I think no, it's it's great. Well I, I think they're great. I mean for one thing, you know, you're doing an audition. You can use um you don't have to learn your lines. You can use a, an auto cue. You don't have to get <laughs> dressed. You, you, you maybe, don't, maybe put a shirt give on. give them all the secrets. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, tune in for some top tips. Just put a shirt on. You can have as many goes at it as you want. You but the, the casting people only see what you consider to be your best effort. And and on the other side, the casting side, you know, you, they'd be, you'd be behind the casting desk. An actor would come into the room. You would see, before he even introduced himself, that he wasn't right for the role that you yeah. had in mind. Or she wasn't right for the role, but you still had to give them their their twenty minutes audition, a waste yeah. of everyone's time. So yeah, yeah I'm all for it. Yeah. Anyway, what were we talking right. about? We're talking, uh, about, we're Richard talking about Richard Dolan, Richard Dolan. <laughs> and his alien agenda and speculation. Uh, it, it, uh, I mean, so, it all seems to be largely speculative, but of course, anything to do with UFOs is largely speculative, isn't it? Even even people who claim to have seen them are still, to a certain extent, I believe, speculating. Well, there is so much that we just don't know. And yes, I think speculation is important. But he's a guy, it, it strikes me as, as a very academic person. Mm. He knows how to study. Yeah. And and study he has. You know, he, he's really gone mm. into, um, when you look at the, the reviews on his work and things like that, you know, he, he clearly goes into his subject matters in a great deal of depth and with a lot of, intelligence and understanding i i'm i'm a good supporter of the guy and when you see him on these shows as well you know he, he speaks with a um i won't say an authority but uh you know he, I'm, he I'm brings, happy that he knows what he's talking about he he brings all the disciplines of his of his field of experience to bear on this rather than being a subject to. Certainly seems to. Uh, not that he's not without his detractors. Um, hmm. And, and certainly, you know, whether you believe UFOs are real, certainly the history of UFOs is a real thing. The history of people's uh, alleged encounters of, of uh, this is all with government actions uh, in in that regard. These these are Project Blue Book. You know, that it's a real thing. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And that is something even to be. If- to study, even if we're talking about um, craft that that are man-made, um, you know, experimental mm. craft or things like that, yes, it's it's you know, it's important 
that these things are documented, that um, mm. witnesses are categorised. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, he, he, I am really intrigued why there is so little about him out there, though. Mm. Um, that seems to fly in the face of someone who is in the public eye. Um, well, is, is he? I mean, he's written a few books. He's certainly written lots of screenplays. Um, he's done TV shows. Is he regarded as someone who's? You know, it, it's like it was like be like the government going after Gene Roddenberry. You know, we just think, well, this guy. I wrote a show. You know, I wrote a book. Well, it's no, been made like into you, a show. You, so the the easy comparison to draw, and um, and hopefully our listeners aren't getting tired of me raising this person. But but Nick Pope is a is a good comparable. I think, hmm. person uh, to use as an example here. And, of course, Nick Pope's all over social media and promoting himself and promoting the work he's doing hmm. um, and what have you. He features uh, very prominently in that Netflix series we reviewed recently. He does. But, I mean, that's the thing. He features just as prominently as... as well, Richard Dolan features just as prominently in stuff as Nick Pope. Hmm. Um, so th that's why I think it's a good comparison. But... And, and I get some people are just very private people, um, but you would think somebody with his level of fame, notoriety, call it what you will, um, yeah, there would be far more out there about him. Um, mm. But there's a lot about his work. But, for example, I don't know when he, and I really tried hard to find this out, when did he start to develop an interest in ufos and why mm. i guess you'd have to read one to of his books probably the, the the first book he wrote that might he might uh, well the kind of research i've done you know it, 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 I've, I'm, I'm fair, i have a fairly high degree of confidence that it would have flagged up you know somebody would have because people write about his work mm. as you would expect um it would have flagged up but no it just seems to be he sort of he left college and suddenly he's a UFO. Well, <laughs> I, I can I, I can quite easily see a seek between writing about the national security state, writing about the Cold War, um, which would include you know false alarms, false nuclear attack alarms, um, alarms about unidentified aircraft coming into US or Soviet airspace, and yeah, and and turning out to be phantoms, turning out to be not what they thought they were, turning out not to be a cause to start a war, mm. um, all those near misses. And then you think, well, what were these things? Mm. Yeah. And that would, you know, yeah. that, I can no, see how you get point. that kind of... That's a good point. I suppose you stumble into it um, hmm. as an unexpected. Yeah, I, I can see that. Who knows? Well, maybe one of our listeners knows and can let us know. Mm. Um, We'd be interested to hear from you what you, what you think about it. Oh, or, yeah. And, or and, if any of you have read any Richard Dolan, please, uh, yeah. Um, we'd love to have a synopsis. Richard, and maybe if you're we, listening to this, get in touch with us. <laughs> We'd love Richard, to hear yeah, from and, you. And maybe we should, maybe we should read, read some Richard Dolan as well. Well, like I say, After Disclosure is definitely on my, on my reading list. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's 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 really well been really well received. Mm. Uh, so yeah, uh, so to summarise then, Neil, so had you when when I said we're going to talk about Richard Dolan, did you instantly know who I meant or no? No, I didn't. I thought I wonder who that is. I better Google him. And and on googling, obviously, you would have seen his image. Did it then sort of fit into place or? No, no. Okay. <laughs> um, I was pretty much directed straight to Amazon and a review of his book about the alien agenda, a okay. speculative history. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that's enough. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when, when I looked at, you know, he's, he comes up on on IMDb. That was the first link. Yeah. Well, the first link was to someone else. So yes. Different to Dolan. <laughs> um, but there's not that that much on IMDb. It just says Richard Dolan is a writer known for Hangar One, the UFO Files, 2014, Sci-Fi Investigates, 2006, and The Underground, 2001. That's full Bio. He also had his own And uh, the Seafall Bio, there's nothing um, there. 
he had, uh, I mean, he's got a weekly radio show, um, but he had a TV show, uh, Richard Dolan's UFOs, I think it was called or something. Did he? Something like that. Yeah, that should be on IMDb. Um, it doesn't anyway, seem to be. Not, Richard to, worry, not to worry. We're not. We're not going to do a podcast of people listening to us googling this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, okay. So now you know a bit more about it. I mean, you 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 seem to be the way you were talking, leaning, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you seem to be leaning towards. He's speculating a bit hard, bit heavy. Is he not in touch with reality? Would you say? No, I'd, without having read one of his books, hmm. uh, I'm thinking, yeah, there is a, there is a real history of things that have happened and the way people have responded to it and various scares about things. They they are real things. Um, whether the thing that they were scared of was a real thing is is another question. I think that's where the word speculative crops up so often. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um no, I can get that. It is for me he yeah, he's a little bit on the he's got an idea of what these aliens are. Hmm. Um it, Oh he's categorised the all different kinds, you know, the greys, the ones that look like better versions of us, the insects, the blobs. Oh no, there, there are lots of categories. I, 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 hmm. I'm not talking about that so much, but he's he 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 seems to have in his head an idea of how they think or how they would mm. think, how they would react to things. Uh, which mm, I, that, I, I find again, it a little bit too speculative for me. They're very speculative. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but what do you think listeners do let us know via the usual means you can email us aliens, explored at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter just by searching Aliens Explored. Or if you join our Patreon, you can get access to our exclusive Discord server where you can chat with us and like-minded folk about all these different episodes that we talk about. The link to our Patreon is below in the description, or you can just go to patreon.com forward slash Aliens Explored. We've got lots of different tiers there. Uh, to suit everyone, and some really good rewards in there, including T-shirts and even the opportunity to record episodes with us. Um, mm. Lots and lots of different things in there. Uh, anyway, in the meantime, do join us next week when we'll be going back to 1959 and talking about a UFO encounter in... Now, I'm going to see if I can say this correctly. Just say Papua New Guinea. In Papua New <laughs> Guinea. Yeah. Buanai? Buanai? Buanai. Buania? Buanai. Buanai. Buania? I don't know. In Papua New Guinea. <laughs> I'm sure. I wonder if, if anyone out there is listening in from Papua New Guinea, we apologise. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but yes, but do join us from that one because that's a really interesting case that we'll be discussing. Um, in the meantime, keep watching the documentaries and the experts on them, and of course, the skies. Take care for now, and, and read those books as well. Bye bye. Oh, yes, do. Aliens Explored is a Fecal Films production in association with Juicy Falls. Music by Darren Mafucci and editing by Stu Jackson. Find us on Twitter or Facebook by searching Aliens Explored or visit us on aliensexplored.com.